Well, hello, it's me, Tristan, that guy from the internet. Yeah, that one's going in the cut. So let's start with a little bit of content warning because of course, this is Step Back. How could I have a video without telling you beforehand that most of it's going to be traumatizing if you have a uh, history or experiences with anything even close to it. So yeah, this is a video about the religious right, about the anti-abortion movement, and about racism and segregation. So if you have, uh, you know, religious trauma or uh, any sort of, uh, you know, uh, trauma to do with pregnancy and, uh, and abortion, then maybe you might want to give this one a pass or at least do it at a time when you're feeling a little bit resilient. Uh, not exactly something for the dark times. I'm just realizing that my channel is about the dark times and we are heading into the darkest of times. So time to pivot, happy step back. So to get started, let's talk a little bit about the recent Supreme Court decision. Yes, my timeline takes long enough that I'm having my Dobbs v. Jackson women's health organization take now. God damn. But essentially what happened is that the Supreme Court in its infinite wisdom decided that uh, WAMs or uh, womb owning individuals don't have the right to decide whether or not they wish to sacrifice their own health uh, in order to uh, continue a pregnancy. And even in cases where it is dangerous, lethal, and a case where not only will the parent, but also the baby will die, that it's not up to them to decide, but it's up to the state governments. And man, does America have a fun history when it comes to leaving decisions up to the states. States' rights. <laughs> and this is all being done under the guise of basically trying to impose a Christian theocratic worldview onto what is supposed to be a country that in its very constitution says that it's supposed to have a separation of church and state. And even in that case, there is also a very strong and very robust theological Christian argument for abortion. You know, Christianity, the religion that started off as being a persecuted cult underneath the Romans, uh, might have some desire to, you know, preserve religious liberty and furthermore live as Christ did. You know, hang out with all of the people that the uptight religious authorities would not have the time of day for. Anyways, the decision by Samuel Alito done in the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization is a milestone in American history. It is this history YouTuber's humble opinion that Dobbs v. Jackson is going to go on the shelf of extremely bad Supreme Court decisions right next to Plessy v. Ferguson and the Dred Scott decision. Which is very interesting because essentially there's the point of this video is that the Supreme Court decision that happened is part of an ongoing religious right project to essentially get back to a time when something like Plessy v. Ferguson was the law of the land. Because after this decision was made, many states had what were called trigger laws, which were laws in the books that basically said they would ban abortion the second that it was legal to do so. So many already have, and we've already started to see horror stories about the uh, legal right to an abortion being taken away uh, and leading to terrible, terrible consequences, which were the exact same consequences that led to the legalization of abortion in the first place 50 years ago. I think the big story that a lot of people know about right now is about a 10-year-old girl who was impregnated at the age of nine, who lives in Ohio, a state where abortion is now functionally illegal. So she had to go to Indiana to uh, receive the medical care that she needed because at the age of 10, she probably wasn't even physically capable of carrying a pregnancy to term. And you know that you've messed up pretty bad when you are going to Indiana for improved human rights. Yep, that's some Hoosier shade and I'm going to stick with it. And this is within a month of the decision. There is a lot more to come and the horror stories are going to stack up on top of each other because not only was this decision extremely bad, but it is just the beginning, and there are a lot more very terrible decisions to come. And to explain why, let's roll back a little bit to uh, the beginning of the abortion debate in the mid 20th century, and where this religious right that really was pushing this uh, pro-life movement really came from. 
Hey everybody, I'm just coming in right before we get into the action because this video doesn't have a sponsor. You know why? Because this topic is super duper bummer and no brand wants to be associated with this. But you know the people who do let me do this kind of stuff, which I think is important even if it is extremely not advertiser friendly, the wonderful people at patreon.com slash stepbackhistory who saw this video early for as little as 84 cents a month. So if you have a few dollars to spare, under no obligation, but if you want to help out the channel, it would be greatly appreciated because let's just say, mm, let's just say the brands aren't exactly lining up to uh, back my content these days. Also, if you don't want to use Patreon, YouTube channel memberships are a thing and they get all of the exact same benefits that uh, Patreon people do. Anyways, let's go. Spoiler alert, evangelicals today might seem that they are really invested in the pro-life movement and that ending abortion is basically synonymous with being a hardcore Christian, but that wasn't always the case. Let's go to the 1960s and look at a magazine called Christianity Today, one of the chief magazines of the evangelical movement at the time. And on their issue in the 60s talking about abortion, there's some very interesting things they say that you would not expect coming from the evangelical movement. Specifically, they debated different aspects of the issue. Some were for abortion, some were against abortion. And at the end of the day, they came to the conclusion that it was a complicated moral problem. Not one that had a simple answer, which is very strong coming from the people who are like the kings of simple answers. At the same time, in the 1950s and 60s, you had the second wave feminist movement, which was a move for stronger civil rights for women. Uh, you know, first wave was the right to vote. Second wave was a lot of like, you know, social, civil rights, things to do with the workplace. And then we get into more like freedoms. You know what? This isn't a feminism history lecture, but the second wave feminist movement essentially uh, made abortion an issue. There were several high profile cases where the dangers of abortion bans were starting to get called into question. And there was a strong uh, movement in the feminist movement to make it a important aspect of their uh, work to get control over whether or not someone wishes to continue being pregnant. And in a seminal case called Griswold versus Connecticut, it was decided some very important uh, things about how someone's uh, privacy comes into play when it comes to talking about their right to get health care. And for this next part, it's just important to note that Roe v. Wade happened in 1973. So the Southern Baptist Convention, which you can imagine is uh, not exactly a bastion of progressive liberal secularism, they came to the conclusion in resolutions in 1971, 1974, and 1976 that the right to an abortion is a good thing and that abortion should be legal. You know, as small government conservatives, they had issues with the government coming in to tell you about whether or not you had the right of control over your own reproduction. They, and a lot of Protestants, actually saw the anti-abortion movement as more of a Catholic thing, because the Pope had decided that abortion was bad, so Catholics actually had a big problem with it. So then, how did we get to such a situation, right? Like, how did we get to a time where evangelical Protestants don't particularly care about abortion, or if they do have a take on it, it's more up to their individual thoughts rather than some sort of religious decision and get to what we have today where you've had radical Protestants unleash a decades long campaign of terror. Uh, what else can you call it when they're terrorizing people trying to go to clinics or literally murdering people who provide this healthcare service? How, how, like, the, the, how do you get, how do you get that far in that small amount of time? Let's talk about that. First of all, there is already a narrative picking up that nobody was talking about anti-abortion stuff until sometimes in the late 70s for political opportunism. We'll get to that in a second. But they're actually, you have to do due diligence. I am a historian after all, and you have to notice that there was always on the ground some form of anti-abortion movement going on, especially in the Catholic community. Basically, the argument that they would make is that life begins at uh, insemination or at uh, the at conception, basically when uh, the zygote is first formed, which um, goes against everything in the Bible that says specifically that life begins at first breath, but 
Whatever, I'm not gonna have the theological debate on this. And the anti-abortion movement got mingled in with a bunch of strong conservative, basically backlashes to the civil rights victories of the 50s and 60s, especially those made for women. A couple of examples of issues that it got mucked up in was the trying to, the attempt to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, which was an amendment to the Constitution that would uh, legally solidify equal rights for men and women, which was famously torpedoed by Catholic conservative activist Phyllis Schlafly. You also got a bunch of other stuff going on in the 60s and 70s. You've got the removal of mandatory Christian prayer in school, for example. You have uh, the general growth and expansion of our definition of the roles of gender and sexuality in American society. And important for understanding this particular issue, the end of segregation in the schooling system, which led to an active process of desegregating schools. And I know talking about segregation when we're talking about abortion seems a little uh, unconnected, but just, just stay with me, okay? Just hang on, but this is super, super important because at this point, essentially, there was no strong religious focused party like the Republicans and Democrats didn't have explicitly strong religious things. If anything, the Democrats were sort of associated with Catholics, especially in the North. But what was going on in the 60s and 70s is you saw this beginning of a political realignment of uh, white people in the South, specifically over uh, racial integration and the end of segregation that uh, made a lot of Southern Democrats who were extremely white supremacist start to alienate from the Democratic Party and move themselves more into the uh, dog whistling friendly hands of the GOP. If you're curious about this process, uh, the big swap, if you will, I made a video about it uh, that's sort of cloaked as a response to Dinesh D'Souza. So I'll put a link if I remember to, and if not, leave a comment saying, ah, uh, you forgot to put the link, but um, yeah, I'll just, you know, a tag or card. Is this a card? Anyways, I'll put it there, put it in the description. And if I haven't, just yell at me and I'll do it. <laughs> but yes, the very big and Catholic-led anti-abortion movement started to get swept up into this right-wing, primarily racism-driven backlash against the civil rights victories of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it all would come to a head in the late 70s, especially when we come to the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. But in many tellings of this particular narrative, it's talked as if this was all manipulation and party, you know, the GOP trying to wrangle and, you know, stir up issues in order to uh, build a new voter base. But it's more complicated than that. And it's just important to note that there was a grassroots movement that was more capitalized on rather than, uh, you know, grown or, you know, astroturfed, if you will. So when they were made legal, the amount of abortions obviously ticked up. And this made uh, some people in the sort of Christian space a little bit uncomfortable. But the main thing that's important to point out is that evangelicals' abortion rights became associated with the second wave feminist movement and the advancement of women's rights in various areas of American society. And because a lot of evangelical Christians have extremely rigid and, uh, you know, uh, prescriptive ideas of what gender roles should be. Abortion sort of got swept into that as part of the things that are changing and therefore something that they were against. So while it was cultivated, there, there's, there's, there's sort of like a, a two-way relationship. You've got a movement that's sort of becoming a little bit more into the forced birth idea. And then you have like a political party that's coming to the conclusion that, hey, there's these people who are really into forced birth. If we support forced birth, then they will vote for that. And if that's the only uh, issue they care about, so they'll vote for that, but they won't care about all the other issues. And then we can sort of push whatever agenda we want because we know that we've got these voters in the bag because all we have to do is say that we're anti-abortion. Fuck, that's a good strategy. That's basically, <laughs> oh man, we are so screwed. So when did this evangelical Protestant Christian right decide that it wanted to care about abortion all of a sudden. Well, it seems that the Christian right really seemed to latch onto it in 1979. For the record, that's six years after the Roe v. Wade decision. It wasn't until 1979 that evangelicals really got on board with the anti-abortion movement. And it wasn't so much like a theological discussion or anything like that, but it actually comes from uh, the works of leaders like Jerry Falwell, but also conservative activists like Paul Weyrich, who were actively trying to gin up different voting groups 
to get Jimmy Carter out of power. And so while a lot of evangelical Protestants today would say that Roe v. Wade was the thing that took evangelicals out of their, you know, place, you know, thinking that they were not supposed to be part of politics, they're supposed to stay out because, you know, that is of the earth and we are supposed to be, you know, elevating above, but instead join politics was not because of Roe v. Wade so much as it was about a different Supreme Court decision you might be familiar with, which was Brown v. Board of Education. So Brown versus Board of Education is the famous Supreme Court decision that decided that separate but equal is not a thing that works and that you cannot have segregated school systems, you can't have segregated uh, government services, segregated businesses. All of these are not welcome and they need to go, which led to a painful uh, process as the southern states that had uh, ex that were clinging on to this white supremacist concept and trying to really hang on to segregation in any possible way they could were facing uh, the backlash that was coming from civil rights activists who wanted these states to you know enact the things that they were supposed to legally enact and they did so with some help of the federal government you know you had cases like the federal marshals who had to escort uh, little black children to schools because uh, they were trying to integrate the school and they had mobs of angry white people who were just furious at the idea of black and white kids being at the same school together. And so one of the insidious ways that, in, particularly in the South, but this happens in a lot of places across the United States, to try and resist racial integration in schools was that the only place that really required uh, racial integration was the public school system. So, uh, they basically started to embrace and all of a sudden have very strong opinions about how bad public school is and that we need to move to private school. So if you notice that in America there is still a very right-wing led undercurrent of trying to uh, promote private schools, this is not entirely but it is a good chunk of the reasoning why. But there was another Supreme Court decision that came up a little bit later that has to do with Holmes County, Mississippi. So in Holmes County, Mississippi, the first year of desegregation, there were 700 white students in the public schools. The second year of integration, that had reduced to 28. 28. And you wanna know what the year after that it was? Zero. And where do you think these kids were going? They were going to private school, specifically a rash of these Christian private schools started uh, rising that were segregated. And because they were private, they did not have to follow any decisions that came with Brown v. Board. They called them segregation academies and they were run by evangelical Protestants who apparently believed on religious grounds that segregation was good. But, but here's the problem. Because they called themselves Christian schools and they were religious organizations, that meant that they were tax exempt, like all churches are in America. And if you think about it, it's kind of weird that the government is sort of giving these organizations money in the form of them not having to pay their share of taxes while they supported this segregationist uh, philosophy at their schools. So some people brought this before the Supreme Court and uh, in a decision called Green v. Connolly, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that giving tax exemption status to these uh, religious segregated schools was tantamount to support and therefore they could not continue having their tax-free status and uh, keep doing segregation. And this, moment is actually what started to energize the evangelicals and move them from this, you know, outside of politics sort of state and move into more explicitly political themes. Uh, because, for example, one of the owners of one of these segregation academies, as they were called, was this little guy you might not have heard of by the name of Jerry Falwell. And for those who don't know, Jerry Falwell went on to become one of the main figures of the religious right and the moral majority and like that evangelical movement. And yes, this movement would actually coalesce into a group called the Moral Majority, which was sort of like a 
Republican pack because a lot of the owners of these schools, these evangelical leaders actually relied on their tax exempt status in order to function and believed on religious grounds that they were entitled to have it. And the real big case that brought the evangelicals out of the churches and into politics was the case of Bob Jones University, which was a segregated fundamentalist school in Greenville, South Carolina. Basically, the IRS in 1970 sent them a letter asking if they uh, supported segregation, and they wrote back a letter saying, yep, we don't take black people. Mm -mm. Because Bob Jones Jr., the owner of the school, said that he believed that in the Bible, it explicitly says that segregation uh, on racial lines is good. Despite the fact that race, as we understand it, didn't exist until probably like the 17th century at the earliest. And yeah, like this, 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 this biblical rationality is extremely bad, but in America, it's very easy to uh, allow a lot of uh, indulgences in antisocial behavior or in discriminatory behavior if you say that you're doing it for religious purposes. Uh, because then they can invoke the freedom of religion part of the Constitution to uh, keep doing their bigotry claiming uh, religious liberty. Um, so if you're ever wondering what the whole like religious liberty argument against gay marriage stuff is, is basically this, again. This is a world where nothing is solved. And someone once told me time is a flat circle. But basically, Bob Jones University tried to reframe the argument about their tax exempt status to not be about racial justice, but about religious freedom. Again, the gay marriage connection is very obvious. They did, they did at one time try to placate the IRS by saying that, well, we actually do have a black student. They took a, a black man who was working for their radio station and let him be a part-time student. And um, he dropped out one month later. <laughs> Uh, the IRS uh, did not accept this, um, oddly enough, and Bob Jones University lost its tax-exempt status in 1976. And a lot of evangelical leaders who have been paying attention to this issue ever since the Green v. Connolly decision, Bob Jones was the last straw and that they needed to do something. and needed to get active because this is, this is important. This is their their tax-free status and their right to discriminate against black people that's threatened. Oh no! Another really interesting aspect of this is that the president at this point was an evangelical Christian. I uh, give you our 39th president, Jimmy Carter. Oh, come on! Beach history's greatest monster! <laughs> Uh, actually was an evangelical Christian and was elected, despite the fact that this was after the Civil Rights Act, still carried the South because as an evangelical Christian, a former Sunday school teacher, he actually brought a lot of religious people into his voting coalition and won on the backs of those in the very religious South. The problem though is that Jimmy Carter, while being an evangelical Christian, uh, probably read his Bible a little too well and believed in a lot of things about love and tolerance and stuff that the evangelical movement was not having anything to do with. And leaders like Jerry Falwell, but also Paul Weyrich, the person I talked about earlier, the, uh, the sort of conservative activist, were trying to uh, do a little bit of an effort to take this evangelical block that had supported Jimmy Carter, but were quickly falling out of love with him for his uh, horrible, horrible takes on um, acceptance and togetherness and, you know, all of those horrible Christian values about sharing and caring and whatnot, um, and tried to mobilize them against him. The very coalition that he won on just Turn them around. But here is the problem that a lot of conservative politicians were having in the 1970s. It was starting to become a little uh, uncouth, like unless you're Joe Biden or something, uh, being against school integration was starting to become unpopular and uh, being explicitly racist in your, uh, you know, your, your pitch to the American people was starting to not be a good look. So they needed to find more and more obscure ways to talk about explicit racism without saying it. You know, basically they were doing the uh, 1970s version of tell me you're a white supremacist without telling me you're a white supremacist. 
and they kept going to more and more abstract things. And so Paul Weyrich made it his mission to find some issue that could mobilize the evangelical base that voted for Jimmy Carter and get them to vote for the Republicans. But as I mentioned, the times were changing and he knew that pitching uh, racism as the political argument to the evangelical base was not going to fly. So he was trying to find different sort of cultural issues that evangelicals would latch onto, and he reportedly had a lot of problems doing that. So he tried various things. He tried to latch on to uh, the, you know, advances that women had made in this period, uh, that the government had been overreaching in various things, including desegregation. But then reportedly on a conference call in the late 70s, the idea of rallying against abortion became the idea of the issue that they could rally the evangelicals around. As I had mentioned, ever since Roe v. Wade, there had been a growing discomfort with the idea of abortion amongst evangelical Protestants. And you already had a very well-established and growing um, Catholic-led anti-abortion movement that had been going on for decades already. And there was already a little bit of inroads happening with this Catholic-led anti-abortion movement starting to make uh, alliances across the aisle with Protestants. So there was already some energy on the ground. This was very exploitable. And Republican operatives thought, hey, this this is a thing. This is a thing that we can latch onto. This is a thing that we can use to uh, get these people to vote Republican. Because a lot of them, they could turn into what are called single issue voters, which are people who vote on only a single issue. And if you can really emotionally motivate people into their anti-abortion stance, they could vote for the Republicans. And, you know, the Republicans could pass a lot of things that don't seem very pro-life, like uh, taking food away from children, tax cuts for the wealthy, you know, the death penalty, all of those, th all of those extreme Christian values, uh, but get the evangelical base to vote for them because they just care about abortion. So seeing that there was energy on the ground, they decided to team up with some anti-abortion activists as well as some evangelical leaders. And through the evangelical Christian leadership at this point started to push the anti-abortion argument down. So as I said, there's this, this bit of a grassroots thing that's taking off a little bit, but then from up top, the uh, evangelical leadership were like, all right, this is the way to get segregation back. So let's, uh, let's like kind of also stoke the anti-abortion argument from above. And to facilitate this, they founded a Moral Majority, which is the religious conservative uh, political action committee I mentioned earlier. And these two met each other uh, and coalesced and really came to fruition in 1980 for the election of Ronald Reagan. Despite the fact that uh, Ronald Reagan as governor of California actually passed one of the um, most liberal abortion laws in American history, um, he still was framed as being anti-abortion and got the anti-abortion evangelical vote to switch from Carter over to him. And since then, the relationship between the evangelical right and the Republican party has essentially been intertwined. In fact, because of some reasons I'll talk about later, essentially the evangelical right has almost taken over the Republican party. And now you really can't rise in uh, Republican politics unless you get the support of evangelicals. And I mean, if you want an example, look no further than the fact that the most popular presidential candidate in the 2016 election among evangelicals, Donald Trump, uh, ascended to victory. Again, uh, two-time divorcee, serial philanderer, and also a guy who lives in a literal golden palace somehow was going to be the beacon of Christian values. Oh my gosh. But they had their coalition, which let them uh, at least go for their, you know, resegregation agenda. And, you know, under Ronald Reagan, while he was not able because of the Supreme Court decisions to actually resegregate schools, the Reagan administration did do as much as it possibly could to make sure that black people and white people had very different experiences living in America through, uh, you know, very uh, discriminatory policing through uh, the pipe, to the prison pipeline, through you know, in, like uh, tax cuts and uh, tax breaks for rich people, all designed to exacerbate class differences. But also, in America, class and race are highly intertwined categories, and 
a lot of white conservatives really don't care about hurting poor white people as long as it hurts black people more than white people. And because of those policies, Ronald Reagan among evangelicals was considered a great victory, despite the fact that there's a lot of signs that he was not like super duper religious in his personal life. And importantly, um, he really didn't mention abortion much, if ever. So, uh, in his, uh, you know, his victory speech, he mentioned creationism and he mentioned uh, what he called the IRS's vendetta against evangelical schools, but the word abortion didn't come up at all. And now the evangelicals are so thoroughly in the Republican Party that there are organizations within like, you know, heavy duty Christian circles to, uh, you know, groom and, uh, you know, prepare young people to go into politics. They have like a whole uh, networking and engine to promote, uh, to basically take evangelicals and get them into politics. And furthermore, because Catholics are also part of this coalition, uh, Catholics are a lot more, um, how do I say this politely? Catholics read more books and do more education than Protestants on average. And so a lot more Catholic, uh, hardcore Catholics who are anti-abortion and, you know, really into uh, conservative values uh, ended up becoming like lawyers. And there was also an engine to take those lawyers and send them into uh, the judiciary and sort of promote them into higher and higher court positions. And all of that project uh, just keeps building and building and building until you have um, the Supreme Court that America has now. <laughs> and you get to the point where they can uh, rescind people's rights to control their own reproduction. And so what does this all serve? Like, what is their ultimate goal? Because segregation is a thing they want to get back, but there's a lot more. And it all comes from the uh, identity or the idea behind uh, their project, which is something called Christian dominionism, which is an ideology that doesn't get talked a whole lot in the media, despite the fact that it's probably the driving ideology of the Republican Party right now. I'm probably gonna make my own video about it, but at its core, Christian Dominionism is the idea that the United States was specially chosen by God to bring about the return of Christ on earth. Uh, something that Protestants want to do because that will bring about the end of the world, which is a thing that Christians want. I, I don't know, I've actually never been to church in my life, so I can't speak to this. <laughs> But because of this, a lot of dominionist Christians believe that they need to bring the U.S. back to some sort of imaginary past. For anyone who knows anything about the definitions of fascism, this is uh, a lot of red flags or a lot of red lights should be going off right now. But they want to bring America back to some sort of imagined past where it governed through uh, Christian values. But essentially what this translates to is they wish to return America to a state that never existed, which is essentially a Christian fascist theocracy. <laughs> and that once they have done so, that is when Christ will return. And that is when the world can end and they will be rewarded for doing so. Is this like the f covenant or something from like Halo? It's not, it's not what the, I don't, I don't, I've never played Halo either, but isn't like the bad guys in Halo, they're trying to destroy the universe because God said so? I don't know. But of course, this is on a spectrum of how much you want Christian values to be imposed on everybody. Uh, there are some that want to go all the way to don't mix fabrics and stone adulterers to those who uh, just don't like the gays. Um, and uh, that variety goes all through basically American Christianity or American, the American Christian right. If you really want to think about it, if you look at the things and the priorities of your average Republican voter in the Republican Party in general, this is what they want. This is the main things they care about. So to call Christian dominionism the, uh, the more or less uh, perfect ideology to uh, describe the current Republican Party is not much of a stretch. Plus there are also sects of Dominionist Christians that believe in something called quiverful, which uh, especially speaks to the abortion issue. Now, anybody who studied neo-Nazi movements will feel very uh, uncomfortable with this idea of quiverful. But the idea is that it's not exactly important to convert Christians because that's not as big a deal. But what happens is you need to uh, outbreed the other people. The other people being very nebulously defined and that they're very concerned about Christian birth rates. And a lot of the people who follow this movement believe that it is almost their God uh, ordained duty to make as many children as possible and that a woman's job is to produce as many Christian, white, 
uh, babies as possible in order to uh, replace everybody else. It's such like a religious dogmatic belief in fertility as basically the only purpose for people who have uteruses that uh, anti-abortion becomes like key to their uh, ideological worldview. And every interview I've seen with former evangelicals or former fundamentalists or extremists have concluded that this decision is the beginning, not the end, and that they have several other things they wanna move forward including segregation. There's even been Republican politicians who said that Loving v. Virginia, the Supreme Court decision that legalized interracial marriage might be something in question. But this decision also makes a very important uh, precedent because this shows the belief that if the Supreme Court that the United States government can and should uh, police the morals of the people who live in their country and that the role of the government should be to impose a very specific type of Christian morality and worldview and force it on others. And this is going to result in a lot of pain. When they rescind gay marriage and all of a sudden you have states that don't recognize legally recognized marriages, uh, you're going to see a lot of pain that comes from that. The very, very tragic case of that 10 year old girl who was the victim of rape having to go to another state to get the health care that she requires is going to become an extremely common case. Uh, some of the people I talk to who work in like social work and who work for abortion clinics uh, will tell you that abortions and uh, the victims of rape being in that age range is not that uncommon. And uh, we're going to see a lot more of this and to sort of suppress the victims of their own policies, the right is going to try and do anything they can to try and diminish or censor these moves. You've already seen that in the case of this 10 year old girl, there's already been uh, like a very targeted right wing movement to try and discredit the story, despite the fact that like the doctor who performed the abortion is on the record talking about it and that this is a very well known phenomenon and anybody who does social work or anybody who performs abortions, that this is like, you know, not unheard of. This is going to be, that this is going to be a horrible set of affairs for a lot of people and that this decision to force other people to fit your own concept of right or wrong is going to create untold amounts of horror stories and victims are going to be abound. But furthermore, you're going to see an expansion of the attempts of uh, parental rights to essentially block off uh, any attempt for their children to be exposed to any worldview that is not that of their parents. You're going to see more of those private school things. You're going to see more, uh, you know, less protections for children who are in homeschooling, who already receive very substandard education uh, because their parents don't want their kids to learn about evolution or to not go to school with black people or any of those uh, various beliefs. And the method they're going to use for that, which uh, we've already started to see, is that they're going to use things like critical race theory and uh, 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 you know gay and trans people existing as a way to create a moral panic in order to push forward uh, more of their ideology, which would uh, force either schools to impose their worldview on other kids or to give those parents uh, the permission to essentially indoctrinate their kids, which is kind of like a form of, uh, of educational abuse, really, or educational neglect, and take them out of the school system and give them a less high quality education just so that they can get ideologically indoctrinated into this sort of Christian dominionist worldview. This is the precipice that we're on. This is where things are going. And um, it's a terrifying state of affairs. And in the wake of the multiple collapsing crises in the United States with like, you know, the next election uh, happening this fall might be the last one in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of very scary things on the horizon. And this uh, Supreme Court is going to be the sort of removal of the last stopgap that really the United States had against a full on Christo fascist takeover of the US. That's really, really bleak, but these are sort of 
bleak times. And the main thing is that there are so many people who are caught up in all of their own personal traumas because of COVID, because of the economic collapse that's happening right now, that they don't have the emotional and psychological bandwidth to also get involved with this, uh, this coup that's essentially happening in the US. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to not uh, be aware of this stuff and to get involved. And uh, I'm hoping that through things like this video that we can talk about the real things that are at stake with these decisions and kind of getting to the point of what Step Back is about, which is that these events that happened today have long histories and they are projects that took decades in the making. And um, in the case of this one, this is a extremely terrifying project that has been around essentially since it propped up trying to support segregation. And now they might be on the precipice of winning uh, their victory, which would be essentially the rollback of every civil rights victory made since Brown versus Board of Education. So this is for all the chips. If you're not aware, if you're not doing something, if you're not you know, getting out on the street, protesting, uh, at the very least voting. I know that that's like kind of a cliche because Demo like vote, saying vote is basically the thoughts and prayers for Democrats. Um, but uh, if you're not aware and actively doing something right now, I urge you to look at the way things are and uh, look at the case of, for example, Weimar Germany in the 1920s, 1930s, and maybe reconsider your inaction. Okay, there, I did that. I got one blood. I think, I think that's a good beat to end on. Okay. So light it up like dynamite. Because Bob Bones, Bob Bones,